This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. With most Major League Baseball games today beginning early, wanted to spend some time and kind of do a smorgasbord kind of episode. We're going to talk some NFL news dumps, talking about DeAndre Hopkins primarily going to Tennessee, whether that matters, how much it matters, Tennessee's outlook and stuff like that. And then talk about Formula One in the at the Hungaro Ring and NASCAR and Pocono to get you ready which should be a fun week in racing once again. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, here to run through that smorgasbord, different topics for today, talking some NFL and then racing later on in the show. If you want to find timestamps for those, check out the episode description, wherever you get your podcast to jump around as your heart so desires for the show for today. We'll dive into all that here in just one second, but first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. Our Women's World Cup preview went up yesterday talking to Dr. Ed Feng about building out his women's international soccer model. We talked about the U.S. versus Vietnam. Ed does like a bet in that game. Talks and futures and much more. Get that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page or over on the FanDuel TV Plus app as well on Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku to get us alongside Up and Adams, Run It Back, and also the solo shot all in one place. The U.S. women's soccer team is taking on the world, and you can take home bonus bets every time they win on FanDuel because right now, new customers get $100 in bonus bets guaranteed plus another $10 in bonus bets for every Team USA win. Sign up between now and August 3rd. Then place your first $5 bet to unlock your bonus bets. That way, you'll be all set to bet on everything from total goals to player props all tournament long. However you want to play, don't miss your chance to get $10 in bonus bets for every Team USA win plus $100 in bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel America's number one sports book must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as is non withdrawable bonus bets, which expire in seven days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. Fanduel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Massachusetts. Hope is here. Gambling helpline MA.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WIPIT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or visit in Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's kick things off here by talking about some NFL because there's not a ton of news going on right now, but it's still a pretty intriguing time of the calendar because you've got players reporting to camp, and that means players going on the PUP list, like Brees Hall for the Jets and a couple other guys going on there yesterday. And that's one thing. But also we have some movement in win totals because if you look at win totals now versus where they were a couple weeks ago, 24 out of 32 teams have had the odds move on their win totals the past couple of weeks. That's small moves for the most part, but it's still moving a bit. So I, if you had checked out win totals earlier on, maybe you didn't see anything you like, maybe you were close on the team, but didn't quite get there. I check back because a lot of teams have moved uh, and you may be getting a better number now than you were before. So I check back on those win totals because even though there hasn't been a lot of news, a lot of stuff happening, there has still been some movement. Let's talk about the Hopkins news. Of course, DeAndre Hopkins signing a two-year deal with the Tennessee Titans. He was a free agent for a while. He did not sign for big money relative to the rest of the wide receiver market, and he's older. So I could understand thinking that this does not matter at all. 
In fact, the market agrees with you because uh, before this signing of the Titans, or a little before this, Titans, uh, their win total is 7.5, and, and the over was minus 105. It's still 7.5, but the over is now minus 102. So things have actually gotten more pessimistic about them in the market than where they were earlier on. That is part because the Colts went up. Uh, their win total, the the odds on that did uh, get a bit better towards the over. So that's part of it. But I do think it's intriguing that Hopkins did not move the needle at all with the market. But he did play really well last year when Kyler Murray, Murray was healthy. If you look at Kyler Murray's passing net expected points numbers, which is number fires EPA metric, when he was targeting Hopkins versus other teammates, there was a massive, massive gap. Murray targeting Hopkins averaged 0.55 net expected points per dropback uh, or per attempt when going to Hopkins. He was at 0.14 when targeting anybody else. So a full 0.4 points per attempt difference between Hopkins and the rest. Part of that's because there were a lot of really rough receiving options in Arizona last year. They had injuries a bunch of different times. Uh, Marquise Brown missed a lot of time. They were cycling through a lot of guys throughout that year. But even 0.55 for Hopkins across 38 targets, which is a small sample, is a very good number. So Kyler Murray was better when throwing to Hopkins than to others. And now we take that and apply it over to the Tennessee Titans. So I think that Hopkins is a bit underrated. I think the same thing about Ryan Tannehill, honestly. The Titans were an above-average passing offense on early downs when Tannehill was healthy last year by a pretty decent margin, and that was with Robert Woods, Traylon Burks, Nick Westbrook-Akina as the top targets on that team. Now, they have Burks, a second year into this offense, hopefully healthy the full full year this time around. Chick Okonkwo looked Pretty good last year, too. Seemed like a pretty legitimate player to gain for that offense. Now they add in Hopkins as well. It's not a great receiving core. In fact, it's still below average. But it is better than what it was last year. When, again, the Titans were above average on early downs throwing the football. So I think Tennessee is somewhat interesting. The potential for them to bottom out is definitely within the range of outcomes because Derrick Henry is old. Tannehill, they drafted a quarterback in the second round to try to replace him, did, did it in the third round last year to try to replace him too. So there is definitely fallout potential here. That's why I have the win total at 7.7 .7 wins personally, based on my model, trying to account for the fact that there is a wide range of outcomes. But again, the market has a 7.5 with minus 102 on the over. So I feel like this number should have moved the other way. I think that the over should be closer to minus 120 or so, somewhere in that range because of the division, because of different factors. I feel like Tannehill may be able to play well enough to fend off Levis, and if he does, that should boost expectations for this team. I'm not going to bet the Titans to win this division because they've got the Jags in that division. The Jags are a team I do like quite a bit. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if I see value on the Titans pretty early on this year. Now, that does not mean week one because they're facing the Saints in week one on the road. And my model, pretty high in the Saints as well. So they're three-point dogs in the road. I'm not going to take that one. But once we get into week two, stuff like that, I would not be surprised at all if I were to show value on the Titans, given that I think they might be a bit underrated by the market right now. I think that Hopkins does make a bigger difference than what the market is saying he makes as of right now. The only other bit of news right now is that the Jets traded Denzel Mims to the Lions. And for the Jets, this does not matter because Mims barely played last year, was not projected to play a lot this year, especially with uh, all the Packers joining that wide receiver room. So it doesn't matter for them. But I do think it's at least somewhat important for the Lions because the Lions are a team that's gotten a lot of buzz this year. They will not have Jamison Williams for the first six games and DJ Chark left in the offseason. Now, you may not care about DJ Chark, but I do. Um, I think Chark was a good player, fit that offense, kind of a field stretcher because they have a Monroe St. Brown who's not going to stretch the field, but is a very good player. They needed some kind of speed element. And they did add Marvin Jones in the offseason, Sam Laporta at tight end, but I don't know if you want to lean on 2023 Marvin Jones to be the kind of speed guy in your offense. I like Jared Goff as a football player because Goff has shown to me he can be efficient in good circumstances. And last year, circumstances were good and they're still okay this year, but they're definitely taking a step back, especially those first six games when Jamison Williams is out. 
So adding in a guy like Mims, who can at least stretch the field with nothing else, is helpful. I'd rather take the chance on him personally if I were the Lions than taking a chance on Marvin Jones in that role. So it does give me a bit more confidence in being high on the Lions entering this year. I have the Lions win total at 10.4 in my model. They're at 9.5 at FanDuel Sportsbook. The over is minus 122. The concerns around pass catching are why I have not bit on this number as of yet, despite showing value there. But it does slightly make me feel better about being high in the Lions, knowing that they've added at least something to that wide receiver core to help compensate for the loss of DJ Shark. It'll get better once Williams is back. Uh, that will definitely help. But I don't think it's it's a nothing burger that Denzel Mims is there. It's at least an upside swing for a team that could use some upside in that wide receiver room right now versus Marvin Jones, Josh Reynolds, Khalil Shakir, uh, the, uh, Khalif Raymond, guys like that. So I feel like it's actually an okay move for the Lions. Have not taken over nine and a half minus 122 personally, but it's at least on my radar as a, a win total I could consider at some point. All right, that's going to wrap up NFL for today. As again, not a lot of news to break down there. Let's shift focus now and talk about some Formula One. Formula One is in Hungary for this weekend. It is the 2023 debut of Daniel Ricciardo, making his debut with Alpha Tauri, filling in for Nick DeVries, who he is replacing for the rest of this year. Looking at the grid here, looking at um, what to do with Ricciardo in his first race, uh, it's kind of taking a combination of the speed he showed last year and putting in an Alpha Tauri car. And that combination is not going to get you a whole lot in terms of modeling. Ricardo plus 195 to finish inside the top 10 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I've got him below that personally. I've got him below y Yuki Sonoda. Uh, Sonoda is plus 195 to finish top 10. He's been pretty good this year. And that's why I have Ricardo below Sonoda. Sonoda's run well relative to that car this year. And Ricardo has not been in that car as of yet. His first drive of the season. So I would not be surprised long-term if I do end up having Ricardo above Sonoda once we get a couple of races in. But at least for right now, I do feel comfortable having Sonoda higher in my model than I have Ricardo as of right now. And I actually do show value in Yuki to finish inside the points, but I think that's underrating McLaren and Williams a bit. Uh, both those teams show quite a bit of speed at Silverstone. So that's something that's pervasive across my entire model this week, where I think it'll need a bit to catch up on the upgrades for those two teams because typically upgrades help teams, but they don't dramatically change their outlook like they did with McLaren at Silverstone and to a lesser extent with Williams there as well. So I need to see how that translates to different tracks, but I do think that I'm too low on them. And as a result, if I'm going to bet something this week, I need it to be a bigger value than I typically would because I do think there are some errors in the model, specifically being a bit too low on McLaren and potentially a bit too low on Williams as well. With that in mind, there are just two bets I'm looking to lock in right now. Those are George Russell the podium at plus 410, which you can find at FanDuel Sportsbook, and then Pierre Gasly to finish inside the points, which you can get out to minus 120. Let's start with Russell, though. He is plus 410, as mentioned, over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The implied odds there, 19.6%. And... This is a market where if the model were to be too low on McLaren, it would lead to funky values looking at Russell. And this is a market where um, if you're looking at past results, Russell has not paid off this bet very much. He has just one podium so far this year. That was in Barcelona. We did bet Russell there as well. So benefited from that one podium. And he's been okay. I would say, especially recently, especially compared to his teammate, Lewis Hamilton, who's been, I would say, the much better Mercedes driver across the past month and a half or so. But Russell has finished fourth, two other races. He was fifth and two more as well. And his pace has been good. And the reason I find Russell kind of interesting right now is because if you look at his pace now versus what it was before the upgrades, he hasn't gotten that big of a bump. He was actually running pretty well before the upgrades, now has had some funkiness in what's happened to him recently. He's had some poor qualifying sessions. A couple of them failed their HQ3 in two out of the past four races, uh, those being uh, the four races outside of Monaco where they've had the upgrades. And it's possible that those poor qualifying sessions have masked the pace a bit for Russell. He did qualify well in Montreal, but he had issues there, did not finish. So I think 
some of Russell's speed post upgrades has been hidden. He finished on the podium and won the pole at the Hungaro ring last year. I think he's a good value of plus 410, even accounting for McLaren surge. I think we can still get to Russell for this week. Plus 410 to podium, pretty good number. He is uh, shorter than four, four to one at most books. So getting to dis- discount at FanDuel Sportsbook as well. So George Russell, the podium, the first bet I like for Formula One for this week. Other one, as mentioned, is Pierre Gasly to finish in the points. It's minus 120 is the best number you can get right now. FanDuel Sportsbook has him at minus 160. I honestly do show value in Gasly at minus 160, but if you can get minus 120, you know, take the take the discount where you can get it. Gasly has had some weird luck this year, too, similar to Russell, where, you know, he's had some races where he's had things outside of his control work against him. But even with bad luck, Gasly has still finished inside the points in six out of 10 races, which is a 60% rate. The implied odds here at minus 120 or 55%. In Silverstone, Gasly had good pace, but got tangled up with Lance Stroll there fighting for the back half of the points. And Gasly also seems to be over the issues he had in qualifying earlier on this year. He's had better race pace than his teammate Esteban Ocon in three straight races. And that's one of the guys who'll be battling for the points this weekend. So I show value on gas, even at some of the books that are more aggressive, including FanDuel. But as always, shop around, get the best number, and try to get Pierre Gasly for a top 10. If you can find minus 120, take it. Otherwise, I do think there is value elsewhere as well. So for F1 this week, give me George Russell plus 410 to podium and Pierre Gasly minus 120 to finish inside the top 10. Let's finish up here by talking about some NASCAR at Pocono. It is a very strange track because it is a triangle. If you've not watched Pocono before, it is very fun. Uh, It has massively long straightaways, which means top end speed matters quite a bit. But quartering also matters too, because you got to build up momentum for the straightaway. And with the cars going slower nowadays than they were before, you can better hold it wide open than you used to be able to. So you want fast cars this week that can also make hay in the turns. So I do care about Nashville and Gateway because both those tracks, although they're not fast, do involve a lot of cornering time. And I think that matters. Once you combine that with like just raw top end speed, my model is Denny Hamlin as the favorite to win this week. He is 13.4% to win for me, but his implied odds are 16.7% at five to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. So I can't get there. And honestly, no outrights. I'm willing to bet at FanDuel right now. Closest for me is Bubba Wallace. He is 30 to one couple top fives of Pocono recently, but even that one, I've got like 0.2 percentage points of value. So not a huge value on Wallace to win either. I think if I want an outright at FanDuel, I want to wait until after practice and qualifying to try to get a better value later on. The two bets that I do like for this weekend uh, before practice and qualifying are a couple of top tens. Those are Eric Jones at plus 430 and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. at 5-1 to one over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's start things off here with Jones. He ran really well here last year, qualified 34th, but he had an 11th place average running position and finished 9th. So that was great. Had good speed in Fontana and Michigan last year too, so the big fast tracks were great for Eric Jones. But Legacy Motor Club has not had great speed this year, and with their move to Toyota next year, It makes sense that they've kind of been frozen out and would struggle for this year. If you look at six races at what I would call higher speed tracks or tracks that fit inside the Pocono bucket, Jones has just one top 10 finish. That came in Nashville, which barely counts. But again, the cornering speed does help there. But Jones did have good speed in Charlotte before an issue ended his day early there. He ran decently in Fontana, which is another big speed track. And this team... Legacy Motor Club has an alliance with Richard Childers Racing, and those cars have always been best on the big, fast tracks. So I've got Jones at 22% for a top 10. His implied odds at plus 430 are 19%. I will take that and be okay betting Eric Jones for a top 10 this week. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is also 22% in my model to finish inside the top 10. His implied odds are a bit lower at 17%, so... He is the bigger value between these two guys. So if you had to pick between the two, I would go Stenhouse over Eric Jones as the best uh, top 10 value for this week at FanDuel Sportsbook. And Stenhouse has shown speed this year. He finished seventh in Charlotte. He was 12th in Fontana, 12th in Kansas. He also had a good car in Gateway before he got caught up in a wreck that was not his fault, got caught up in a 
you know, kind of hissy fit between a couple of other drivers. He was just kind of innocent, innocent bystander. So that was not his fault. Good speed there, though, before the wreck. Stenhouse at Pocono has raced here 19 times. He has zero top tens. So that's not great. But his form is better now. He has six top tens this year. That is tied for the second most in his entire career for a single season. And his average finish this year is the best it has ever been by a pretty decent margin. So I know Stenhouse has never finished top 10 here, but I don't want to overweigh that in my mind. And we're getting a decent discount at five to one. So to me, Stenhouse, interesting enough at five to one, my favorite top 10 bet for this week over at FanDuel Sportsbook and one I would be willing to make with the odds where they're at right now. As far as guys to monitor throughout the weekend, Ryan Blaney, Tyler Reddick, Bubba Wallace, all guys I keep an eye on. I did take Blaney 14 to one elsewhere. He's 10 to one at FanDuel, so I can't quite get there. Reddick, I would need probably about 16 to one or so uh, to bet him. Wallace, 32, 35, somewhere in that range, I would take him. Uh, but those are the three guys to me I'm closest on relative to the market. I have value in Ross Chastain, but his form is very, very weird right now. So probably not getting there. But for now, we'll stick with Jones at plus 430 for a top 10 in Stenhouse at five to one. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Uh, back again tomorrow talking to Pitching Ninja, breaking down the pitching props, strikeout props across the slate in Major League Baseball. I'll talk some money lines as well. Uh, find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed on the FanDuel YouTube app and over on FanDuel TV+. Plus. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Thursday. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down some strikeout props. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 